Hi, this is Mike Sowers, and thanks for tuning in for today's episode. I have Brian Hennessy. He wrote a few different books, one that absolutely changed my strategy and system for how I conduct due diligence. Today, we're going to jump in how to ask for a discount, whether you should, and if you do, how to do it the right way by having third-party reports. We're going to talk about how to go through the due diligence process to make sure you're systematic about spending money to limit your exposure and reduce risk. We're going to talk about when you should go hard with your money and how to exchange that for a discount if needed. We're going to talk about how with the appraisal, you should be a fighter pilot, not be on autopilot. We're going to talk about reinforcing positive aspects of the appraisal and being a learning machine. He's going to talk about how you cannot learn without failing along the way. We cover it all on today's episode. Brian Hennessy, welcome to the show. There are two kinds of people in the world. Those that worry sharing their ideas will hinder their success and those who are driven by the success of others. The first kind view everyone as a competitor. They guard their playbook tight to their chest, rarely collaborate outside their inner circle and are reluctant to show their cards. Then there are the second kind, the kind who have graduated from the first category. They don't count the number of deals they've done. What counts to them is the number of people they impact and the depth to which they impact them. Achievement is still important to them, but it's subordinated to the depth of their purpose. So they give freely of their time, knowledge, and expertise to build a bridge for those who follow in their footsteps. These are the people who were called to change the world. These are the people who develop people, places, and ideas. This is the show where they do it on the Creative Commercial Real Estate Podcast. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Mike Sowers, the host of the show, and I got some awesome news for you. I've been writing a book for 14 months. It's called Commercial Real Estate Investing. It's going to be hitting the shelves summer of 21. But since you've been a loyal listener, I'm going to get you on the list to get a free copy of the book. No gimmicks, no joke. Get on the list, and I'm going to ship you out a free copy. You're going to have to pay shipping and handling, but I'll cover the cost of production. I left nothing out of this book. I literally cover everything, how to find and fund deals, how to figure out exactly what to pay for them. I go through exactly how to estimate repairs, how to lease properties, do asset management, and refinance your property and cash some ridiculously big checks. So go get your hands on a free copy or you can get the ebook for $2.99. I'm just giving this stuff away to you guys because I know it's gonna bless your life and take your investing game to the next level. Go get it right now, creinvestingbook.com. Welcome to another episode here on the Creative Commercial Real Estate Podcast. I have Brian Hennessy joining me today. He's a, he's a real estate investor. He has a coaching system called Impact Coaching Systems. He's also a licensed broker at Avison & Young. And he's authored a few different books, one of which was one of the very first commercial real estate books I ever read called The Due Diligence Handbook. And uh, it's something that's super exciting. And it, we still use that as part of our playbook for our due diligence on our commercial deals. So welcome to the show today, Brian. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and how your journey progressed uh, as you got into the commercial game and uh, you know how, how your coaching system and your uh, brokerage kind of intertwine with each other. Well, what happened, how I came about uh, writing the due diligence handbook for commercial real estate is uh, I had been a commercial broker for 18 years. And one of my clients who used to buy and sell properties as their avocation decided they wanted to do it full time because they were actually making more money on their real estate transactions than they were doing their, their, their previous, you know, um, profession that they were in. So, uh, he worked on trying to get me over, but, uh, it took him about, well, almost a year and a half because I told him, look, you just don't buy enough property to, for me to warrant, you know, jump and chip and coming over there. But, uh, we didn't talk to each other for about six months and, um, then one night he called me at home 
and uh, said, hey, I really want to talk to you about coming over and working with me. And I said, well, look, you know, we had that conversation. You don't buy enough property. He goes, no, I bought 500,000 feet since we've spoken. And I was like, really? Well, you didn't buy it around here? And he goes, no, no, I bought it in different states, Texas, and I forget where else, Alabama and some other place, right? And he, and I, he said, look, just do me a favor and come talk to me uh, this week and I'll, I'll show you what I'm thinking. So I said, okay, fine, I'll stop by. So I went by his office and he laid out this plan that he was doing and it was pretty ambitious. I was like, wow. I go, how are you going to pull all this off? He goes, well, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm just going to keep plowing away and build it up and, and I could use your help. And I was like, well, let me, uh, let me think about it and talk to my wife about it. So that's what I did. And she said, well, if you think he's really going to buy a bunch of properties and, you know, why not give it a shot? So that's exactly what I did. I went to work with him and uh, that's when it just really started uh, moving because the market was starting to turn around and he became a very aggressive, uh, investor, got a lot of investors to, to invest with him. And we ended up buying a lot of property, uh, over 8 million square feet in about four years, less than four years that I was with him and all over the country. And it was really quite the, uh, whirlwind ride because, it was a little group that we had. We had to really uh, be on our A game. And what happened is the first couple of large transactions that we did, I really got taken to school on by these professional institutional owners. And that's when I started writing my own reference manual, which ended up morphing into the due diligence handbook for commercial real estate, because I, I really didn't think that book was ever going to sell one copy. I just took my reference manual when I went back into brokerage and said, well, okay, you know, I'll just copy it, put a cover on it, put it on Amazon. I, I'm not going to get it formatted because it's never going to sell any. And so, uh, but what happened was um, it ended up taking off and it was like, wow, this is really interesting. Maybe I should take it more seriously. So I, I, um, took the, the, the manual and I put some stories in it, made it a little more personable. And uh, I was working for Collier's at the time and I met the CEO at a conference and he said, hey, would you be willing to do a, a webinar for us? You know, to, and I said, sure, I've never done one. He goes, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll put it together. You just have to show up and do it. And we did, and it was really well received. So I started doing seminars. I took the book and I morphed it, got a professional cover done and put it out there and it took off and still blows my mind that it's you know, selling as many copies as it does. So, but I, it, it helps people. And that's really, I think, where uh, the rubber meets the road on it is nobody really had taken their experiences and their lessons and documented it and put it out there. and. It's because it's, I tell people it's the least sexy part of the business. You know, it's people have to really roll up their sleeves and do a lot of work. Uh, and a lot of people don't like that. They'd rather crunch numbers and sign contracts. And, you know. right. <laughs> but the problem is uh, that's not what makes it a good deal. You know, it's yes, it's an integral part, but it's really to me, due diligence is the crux of of real estate investing. If you, you really make your money on the buy, you realize the value on the sale and you really want to eliminate as much risk as possible when you're in the transaction before your money becomes non-refundable. And that's where you really, really get the most bang for your buck. Because if you, if you're doing that, you learn how to do it properly. Uh, you can go back to the seller or the broker, or whatever the case may be, or both and say, listen, guys, what we signed up for at the beginning of this transaction is much different now that we've had the opportunity to go through the due diligence thing. And here's some things we never knew about. Therefore, we're going to need a discount or a price reduction or whatever, the, whatever the case may be, a credit, depends on what it is. But and I always tell people, look, it's really not what you ask for. It's how you ask for it. 
right? If you ask for it properly, your chances of getting it are go way up. Talk to me about that. So, um, so what advice do you have when you are, are going to kind of retrade the deal with the seller on how, how do you approach them? Well, first of all, here's one thing that I always tell people. You, you need to have legitimate uh, reasons for asking for price reductions. I, what happened is over time, I've seen people uh, just think it's okay just to ask for a discount because you're, you, you, you think it's, you can get away with it, right? And the fact of the matter is you're doing yourself and everybody else there a huge disservice because if you get that kind of reputation as an investor, people are going to stay far, far away from you. And let me tell you something. This is a very, very tight little business that industry that we're in. If you don't think so, I'll tell you when I really learned it is when I started buying properties across the country. And I realized when I was sitting in Chicago or Dallas or Orlando or wherever I was doing the deal, and you start talking to lenders and brokers and stuff, and you start hearing about people from your neck of the woods that they say, I would never do a deal with that guy or that gal or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, right? It's a really it's, small oh, community. Here we are, you know, 2,000 miles away, 3,000 <laughs> miles, whatever the case may be. And here they are, you know, their reputation precedes them because they have the same reputation in the neighborhood that we were in <laughs> and, they, and they've earned it out here too. So right. it's really, I tell people, all you got really in this business is your reputation. So treat it with the utmost care and um, sacredness because it's really what you're, you're marketing out there when you're going after deals and what have you, right? Right. And it's just important. It's the it's the golden rule, really. And that's what it always boils down to is, you know, treat others the way you would want to be treated in there. Hey, what's up, guys? It's Mike Sowers, the host of the show. I hope you're enjoying the content and I have some awesome news for you. We're now rolling out our exclusive partnership program. And what we're doing is we're looking for investors just like you in all major metros to partner with on deals. I give you our strategy, our system, all seven steps, our funding and support network, and I'm even gonna give you our software to actually go out and implement these techniques so you can cash that first ridiculous seven-figure check. I've used this exact system to go out and create millions of dollars in net worth and tens of thousands of dollars in residual income each month. And honestly, I don't say that to impress you, but to impress upon you that the system works, you just have to follow it. But it's not for lazy people. I mean, it takes real work. You're gonna need about thirty dollars to $50,000 in working capital, and you're gonna need a resilience that very few have. But if you're ready to take your investing game to the next level and scale up from flipping, wholesaling, and residential rentals into the commercial game, you can get 10 times the results with literally the same amount of effort. I'm gonna show you how. Why don't you check it out? Go to commercialinvestingmastery.com. You can learn more about the program. You can apply for membership, and you can even schedule a one-on-one -on -one call with me to get all your questions answered. Check it out right now. That's commercialinvestingmastery.com. I look forward to hearing from you and I wish you all the success. So let's dive a little bit into that. Let's talk about, you know, what walk me through your, your let's say you uncover something. How do you approach the broker, or the owner? And uh, and present your case for them giving you a discount or additional time or what whatever the concession is. Okay, so let's let's say you're going through your due diligence and you're doing all the physical and the financial stuff, and you're running into some uh, hidden uh, trip wires and landmines that you are starting to get concerned about. You're keeping a list, obviously. Uh, of what your findings are and you're constantly adjusting your un underwriting as you go through and you uncover these things. Now, that's another mistake I see people make is they really don't scrutinize that very carefully. They ballpark it in their head and write it on a piece of paper, or, you know, type it in somewhere, but you really need to plug it in your underwriting, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, what happens is you might run across something that's like, whoa, I never anticipated this kind of a problem here. Let me give you an example. 
I was looking to purchase about 150 uh, apartment units in Golden, Colorado. And um, it was an off-market deal. A broker had told me about it. And I said, uh, all right, yeah, I, I'm interested. You know, I took a look at it. it looked pretty interesting. It was a good, good area and needed. It was basically taking a C-plus building to a, a B building was the game plan, right? So I said to him, I, uh, look at, um, I'm going to only be here for a few days. I, you know, I, I gave him an offer and I said, I'd really like to get started on the inspections right away while we're negotiating this purchase and sale agreement. Right. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, well, let me see if I can get the seller to agree to that. Well, the seller said, no, no, I'm not doing that until I know that we have a deal and we're in escrow. And I said, well, wait a second. You know, do you really want to at, have a bunch of legal fees thrown on this and then me find out that there's something I can't live with? Why don't we just do it concurrently? And because uh, I'm only going to be here a couple more days and then I'll, I'll go through that and we'll, we'll get it done. And he said, OK, fine. As long as you can get me the insurance I need, uh, you're more than welcome to. I said, OK, so we did. And I had an army of guys there next day. And we're going through it, and uh, the contractor said, I was in the management office talking to the leasing, you know, and he said, can I speak to you privately? I said, sure. So I went outside, and he said, I, I uncovered some stuff here I want to show you. So he walked me over to this stairwell, and there were some footings that he dug around on the stairwell in the, in the staircase, and there was cracked uh, footings. And uh, there was a, some plywood that was built around it to like cover it up, right? And he says, uh, I don't know how many of these there are, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess there's more than a couple here. So I'm going to go through all these and I'll get back. I said, do me a favor. I got to go to the airport this afternoon. Why don't you call me later when you have a chance to go through this so I can get just a debriefing on what you found. So we went ahead and we had other stuff. We were going through units and what have you. So I get to the airport and he calls me up. He said, well, what do you want? The good news or the bad news first? And I said, just <laughs> talk to me in dollars, okay? And he said, <laughs> okay. He says, well, there's a bunch of these issues uh, that we looked at. And I don't know if it's a million and a half or two million, but you're looking at a lot of money to fix all these. And I go, that's all I need to know. I'm not... I'm not going any further with this deal. So I called the broker up and said, hey, look, I'm really sorry, but tell the seller I'm, I'm going to pass on this. There's just way too much uh, involved with making all this stuff right. And then the broker had told me, well, you know, he doesn't surprise me. It fell out of escrow a couple of times. So um, so there's, an, there's a, an example. I couldn't go back, right? But ones that I have gone back and said, hey, look, you know, we went through the inspection. The roof, you know, is basically at the end of its uh, useful life, right? It looks like a patchwork quilt up there, right? And then your uh, HVAC unit, or if it's one unit, or if it's a chiller unit, or if it's a bunch of units, are all shot, you know. So I'm gonna. I wasn't planning on that, right? And then uh, if there's an elevator in there, hey. I'm going to have to make this modernize because this thing is not settling at the threshold and, and you've got fraying of the cables and in, engraving on the uh, drums and, you know, I, it's going to be a lot of money. So let's either talk about, you know, getting a credit. I don't have to replace everything right now, but based on these numbers and, I always tell people, I don't care if you're a contractor, go get a third party report, hire a contractor, or go get a company like, depends on the size of the project, obviously, but if it's a sizable project, you want a reputable third party uh, property condition assessment report. And before you hire them, make sure the lender approves of the vendor. The, <laughs> the, the, the bigger ones, most of them are on, but don't assume, just shoot a quick email off to them. Hey, I'm going to be hiring this group as a property condition assessment report for it, an environmental report. Are you okay? 
and they'll tell you no. Okay, well, send me your list of people, your approved vendors, so I don't have to be keep calling you up. And then uh, <clears throat> once they put the report together, then you can say, look, I've got you know two hundred ninety thousand dollars worth of items here. I don't expect you to you know, give me a discount for all of them. But these four things of $174,000, I'm going to need a, a discount. Otherwise, the numbers just don't make sense. Sure. And if you got documentation from a third party showing that, they may, you may get the whole discount. They may come back and say, no way, I'm not doing that. You know, uh, I'll give you a hundred. And then you can start negotiating with them. You know, you can say, look, you know, why don't you get make it 150 or whatever, and then we'll call it a day, and I'll go hard with my money today, if you can agree to that. You got to give them a reason to do it now. If you don't, I mean, what are they going to, if you're still in your due diligence period, and you got a week to go, and you're you're saying, well, I haven't found everything yet. I need to keep going. Well, then why am I giving you this discount? You got to give them a reason. Hey, I'm ready to release my deposit, go hard with my the earnest money deposit and, uh, you know, move forward with getting the loan done. By the way, don't do it unless you're ready, willing, and able to do that. Unless you're, <laughs> right. unless your lender says, yeah, you're golden. We just got to get the appraisal in or whatever. We're, we're okay. We talked to the appraiser. He thinks there's no problem or whatever the case may be. Right. Yeah. And, and that was the way we got the deal done, but we got a smoking deal on it. So it makes sense for me. Sure. Um, but that lender just got back to me and said the committee didn't like the MESDET piece of it. And so <laughs> how much did it cost? Hopefully the phase one that I ordered from them is going to be usable by the other lender, but in a lot of cases it is. So sometimes like if for the people listening to the show, if you're going to order your phase one or uh, usually the lender orders the appraisal, right? Right. But, right. But the by phase the way, we'll one, talk, we can talk about that if you want to. That's an important sure. part. But yeah, the phase one and in inspections, a lot of times it, it's good to, uh, I, I think Brian's got solid advice there to make sure that the lender approves it because uh, more times than once we've had things done and then the lender goes, well, we can't even use that phase one. They're not an approved vendor. And then you have to try and get them on the approved vendors list or reorder which it. Takes, or, which usually takes too long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a nightmare. So that that's solid. So let, let's talk about the appraisals. What okay. are your thoughts on that? Well, what I tell people is, uh, and it's it's really pretty common that a lot of investors, brokers, whatever the case may be, uh, will let appraisals go on autopilot. And what I tell them is, you should really be on fighter pilot, not autopilot. Okay, mm -hmm. because you can't assume that that appraiser is going to come up with a number that you need. So I I flat out just ask the, the lender for the appraiser's contact info. And when they say, well, what do you need that for? We usually don't give that a well, because I want to make sure they have all the necessary information to properly evaluate the investment, because there's things in there that, um, you know, they, they may not know about, like pending proposals and our game plan for lowering expenses and da, da, da. And most of the time, don't forget, lenders want to get the deal done. So they, they're not going to fight you on it. You know, I, you know, what happens is once in a blue moon, I'll get an appraiser that says, well, I'm really not supposed to talk to you. Listen, I've got information here that's going to help you. I, and I think it's well worth your while to meet with me because I want to go out there when you're walking the property. And so um, what happens is most appraisers really appreciate it if you're actually giving them sale comps, lease comps, mm -hmm. your game plan for lowering expenses, uh, pending proposals and lease transactions, stuff that's going on in the area that actually uh, reinforces the positive aspects of, you know, the investment. And uh, and I've had numerous times where they said, wow, that's, I didn't even know about that. I'm so glad you gave this to me because that's going to make a huge difference. And so uh, rather than uh, hope that it all works out and, and throw in the dice, you're much better off uh, being proactive about it, showing up with all the information. By the way, they love it when you're 
helping them do their job. Okay. You saving them a lot of work and energy and digging and, and when you show up and as long as you're not a jerk about it and trying to shove it down their throat, you know, I've had them say, ah, oh, no, that's okay. Just hand it to me. I'll, I'll look at it later. No, I'd rather go through it with you just so you understand what we're, we're talking about here. And then you can explain any nuances on the comps or whatever. <clears throat> that way they're like, oh, okay, good. Okay. That makes sense. Not only that, I don't just assume that they get everything and they go back. I call them a few days later. Have you gone through that? Are we okay with the number? You know, nah, I'm still working on it. I need some more. Okay, tell me, tell me what's going on. And usually when the I said, when is the appraisal due? That's ah, due next, you know, Thursday. Okay. I'll call them up on Wednesday. Right? Yeah. We good. Our number good. Are we okay? Yeah, we're good. We're good. Okay, good. All right. So your chances and your your odds go way up in your favor when you're proactive like that. And you can sleep much better. Otherwise, what happens is, I, which I've had happen, is the, the appraiser comes in with a lower number. And what happens is, hey, the, now the lender wants you to reserve for stuff. Uh, they don't want to give you the same loan that they were talking about. You got to come up with more money. It's like, whoa, 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 time out. What's, where is the information that's making this change for you. Well, we got this appraisal in at X. Well, where, does, where are they coming up with that? Can I see their sale comps and lease comps? And then you look at them and it's like, oh my gosh, this is not even in the same ballpark. You know, why are we right. talking about this? So the lenders now bug because they're trying to make a loan and they got to backpedal. And it's a lot harder to backpedal than it is to. So the lender will call the appraiser up and say, listen, this isn't right. I just talked to the buyer. He's got information. You really need to go back and revisit this stuff. And then you got to go resell them on this. And then it's like, okay, I see what you're saying. I didn't realize that was the case. And da, 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 you know. And it's like, oh gosh, that's why you want to be on the front end, not, not figuring it out after the fact. Yeah. You know? Proactive. Yep. Have you have you had to challenge appraisals before? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Even after I gave them information. But then when you shoot holes in their information, that's why you got to be on it. You can't just, you know, think, oh, okay, I'll wing it. No. Go in there with your ammunition, guns, you know, like here it is. This is why, you know, your comps, your sale comps don't make any sense. Sure. Okay? You forgot that this particular sales comp you're using as recent didn't have the same parking ratio or you know, is dated as this going for it, that going, it's got under market rents in there, you know, it, you know, whatever, you know, there can be a myriad of things, right. <laughs> you know, so you got to sometimes be creative with this stuff too. Yeah. Well, I just have to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Your, your book really, really helped me streamline the due diligence process. And that's like you said, where the rubber meets the road and it's where you structure away a lot of the controllable risk. There's obviously uncontrollable risks that you can't structure away and you have to just use strategy to try and structure that away. You know, maybe, uh, you know, how you're buying, where you're buying and that, how you're structuring your capital stack. Um, I actually use a very similar version of your due diligence documents list. And we've been requesting, um, or actually, sorry, putting that as an addendum uh, onto the purchase agreement. So it's actually- Have you did that before? Yeah. Yeah. Written into the PA that they have to provide those certain things. Before we were just asking for it after closing, it was kind of like whatever. Another thing we tweaked, which uh, resulted from reading your book is- we actually set our contingency period from the day they deliver the last document, not right. from the day the purchase agreement signed. Right. That way they have an incentive to get you everything quickly. And if they don't, we automatically extend our contingency period. Right. And yeah, now you, that. You wanna, it works a lot better that way. You know, it just obviously can't always get everything. Right. Because, but you try to get as much as you can. And uh, the reality is that, if you're dealing with a motivated seller, they're, they're not dragging their feet. They, they want you to come to a conclusion pretty quick. And hopefully their broker is, uh, you know, smart enough about it that, you know, they're working in a uh, 
proactive way to get as much as they can for you up front, which kind of what kind of bothers me sometimes is, you know, when you start drilling down and trying to get um, certain documentation, what have you, they'll drag their feet, you know, and it's like, what do you, you know, listen, uh, you know, not to be uh, uh, critical, but you want to find out if, if you got a real buyer here as soon as possible, not on day 29, You'd like to know that on day 14 or 15, right? <laughs> you know, why, why wait to the last second and hope that, you know, oh, something's going to slip through the crack and their money's going to go hard. No, sorry. You got the wrong buyer, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, let's move on to your new book that you're writing. It's written. It's out. It's on it's, Amazon. Oh, yeah. when, when did that come out? That came out last week. Oh, uh, it's not it a real called? estate book, though. It's not yeah. a real estate book, which is kind of interesting because this is a book I, I really wanted to write for a while, probably the last three to five years, really. What, what's it called? It's called "Too Old to Hire, Too Young to Retire: A Comprehensive Guide for Body, Mind, and Soul." And uh, really, it's 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 the reason I titled it that is it really. It could help pretty much anybody. I don't care if you're a millennial just getting started out. It probably would be super helpful for them as well because there's a lot of lessons that I've learned over my career that could be implemented, you know, with for people. But I, I, I truly believe that during this very transformational time that we're in right now, there's a huge amount of opportunities out there for people. But the boomers and even some of the Gen Xers are – you know, been outsourced, right sized, you know, their businesses or professions have been turned upside down or whatever, or trying to figure out how to get unstuck from this stuff. And it's, you know, one of those things like, okay, what do I do? I mean, uh, basically the rug got pulled out from underneath me. How do I get back on track here? Right. Sure. And um, so it's basically part inspiration, part instructional, part resources. I got, I have 47 tips and strategies and resources to get unstuck in there. And uh, I've had some really good feedback on it. And it's really, it's really was a labor of love because, uh, you know, I, I truly believe when, when I get, when I do podcasts or go do seminars or whatever, webinars, uh, people inevitably end up asking me, what's the most important points that you need to learn about, you know, doing commercial real estate transactions? And I always tell them it's love and service. And they go, I kind of get those deer in the headlight looks sometimes. And it's like, listen, we're here to serve God, love others, and play our role to the best of our abilities. And that's what we're here for. You know, one of my favorite sayings uh, is greatness doesn't lie in the role we play, but how great we play our role. And we all have roles to play and they're all different. We can't all be the king or queen of the hill or whatever it is. Right. Everybody's part is important. So we want to do it to the best of our ability. And if we use that as our our guidepost, our pole star to uh, influence our decisions and our direction, and how we treat others, you're not going to go wrong. Yeah. Because you're going to be guided by the master director who's out there uh, directing all this. So you, you really, really, when I tell you that, what happened, I, I truly mean that because I've seen it happen in my life. When you approach uh, your transactions and the people you're dealing with, with that uh, mindset, they have a totally different uh, demeanor and energy for the most part that, you know, you're delivering to them. And they're, it, most of them get a lot more comfortable and feel like, hey, this person is really trying to do right. You know, I feel much more comfortable. Sure. So um, at looks any like, rate. Looks like my video cut out, but we'll, we'll keep going here. Um, okay. talk, talk to me about... Um, what what role does your faith play in your career? Uh, it plays a huge role because I start my day and end my day and meditate. I, uh, I throughout the day I, I remind myself what I'm doing, 
and who I'm doing it for and why I'm doing it. And um, it really, really is play, plays a huge part for me. So I, I, I would yell it from the tallest building, from the highest mountain that this is the way it works. And don't take my word for it. Prove it to yourself, because if you don't prove it to yourself, it's really just blind faith. Right. Right. That's but once so you awesome. prove it to yourself, you'll have it in your DNA. And there's no way anybody's going to shake you away from that. That's what you want. You want that foundation of rock underneath you. And I can tell you that it's a beautiful thing. And that's what I talk about in my new book. It's really, listen, it, it doesn't have to be, you know, really, really hard. You making it harder on yourself. If you're trying to get yourself unstuck and trying to figure it out, why do it by yourself? Right. Right. Develop that, develop those flabby, weak, faith and courage muscles and get moving on it. Start working them out and yeah. it'll, and, it, and it'll prove itself. You prove it to yourself. For sure. So Brian, you're, you're obviously a, a tremendous asset and uh, it's been such a blessing having you on the show here. What, what advice would you have for somebody who's just getting started investing into commercial real estate, specific action steps that you would recommend that they take? Okay. Um, I would say that, you know, one of the first things you really need to do is um, get rid of the idea and fear of failure. Okay. Failure and success are interrelated. You don't get one without the other. That's how I wrote the due diligence handbook for commercial real estate. I made a lot of mistakes and learned a lot of lessons. Okay. <laughs> but in the process, okay, I build up some stronger faith and courage muscles and more confidence. I made me a much more competent and confident investor. And so don't be afraid of that. That's part and parcel of just being in the biz. You're going to make mistakes. However, try to learn as much as you can. Be a learning machine. Never stop learning. I'll tell you, I've been doing this for over 36 years. Okay, I still listen to podcasts. I still listen to audiobooks. I still read stuff. I, I, I'm constantly looking at webinars and, and, and learning as much as I can. Why? Because there's always something new that pops up. And I want to tell you something, especially in today's commercial real estate investment world. And I don't care what genre you work in. I don't care if it's multifamily, office, retail, industrial hospitality it doesn't matter you you really really need to know your stuff because what's happened now is the the game has been turned upside down okay and so if you, let's say for instance you're going out and you're looking at a uh, industrial building somewhere you got to ask yourself what else can this be besides industrial Right. Like highest and best use. Five years from now or 10 years from now, I still own this. And the tenant that I had on a 15 year lease is gone. What else can I do with this? Or, or an office building or a retail center or whatever. You know, I've told uh, I've got a client that buys retail centers and he buys a lot of medical stuff. And I said, if we're buying retail, I think we should look at it as if these retailers don't make it. You know, what else can we do here? Is it close enough to a medical center that we could put medical type users in there? Or if this is an industrial building, is there, can there be, is there enough parking here and amenities around that we could turn this into a creative office or a portion of it is creative office or maybe even a quasi retail, uh, you know, uh, office and something else center, right? You've got to be thinking outside the box a lot because let me tell you something. As long as I've been doing this, never have I come across uh, a scenario that uh, a downturn has created that is this deep and this wide, widespread, so to speak, right? And so we're going to see some of these transformations were already starting to happen, for instance, in the retail office, et cetera. But when the pandemic hit, it basically 
stomped on the accelerator pedal, right? So now if you ever needed to know due diligence, which I should say you should know it from the beginning, but if you ever needed to know it, now is more important than ever because you really got to be doing your homework, really got to be doing your upfront uh, due diligence and metrics and make sure you're covered in every which way. So when you step in, you're, you're, you're confident. By the way, the other thing I would say is don't fall in love with your real estate deals. Be able to walk away from them. If they aren't working, quit trying to justify them because you got a few bucks invested in them. You're better off sometimes just walking. To get back to the due diligence part, you say, well, what happens if they don't give me the discount? Well, look, if the numbers don't make sense without it, then don't do it. Walk away. I've had them call me back a week later, three days later and say, okay, I'll tell you what, we'll give you that discount. I've had them call me back four months later and say, hey, you know, uh, we're ready. We had it in escrow and they had the same issues, but you're a better buyer. We're ready to go with you. Well, guess what? I don't know if I want it at that price now. The embers have cooled. I, I want a better price on it. What's the most you've left on the table and locked? <laughs> um, that's a good question. <laughs> I think we left. Oh, gosh, it was probably just shy of a couple hundred thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah, we were into it pretty deep and went pretty long. And we we actually probably should have walked a lot sooner, but we kept thinking that there may be a way to still make this work. That's what happens is that's why I emphasize that so much is you can get you can kind of fall in love with the deal. Yeah. You really want to, gee, this really could work. And I really think that we could. Well, then you start, there's a fine line between falling in love and justifying, you know, trying to justify the deal, because especially when you've got a bunch of investors money into the thing. Right. And they're like, you know, well, you're going to do you're not going to do that deal. Well, what else you got? Because if you don't got that, send the money back. You know, well, there were times when I just said, I'm done here. Sorry. Here's the money. We couldn't make it work. And we just passed because of things that we found out. Could be something that happened in the with the a tenant that was in there, or uh, things that were being hidden by the sellers that we didn't know about. That we're like, whoa, that's more than we want to deal with, right? Right. So you just got to know that you know that's just part of the game. I tell people if you're not willing to walk away for from some money once in a while, then don't get involved with this. This is the wrong game because it's part and parcel of playing in this environment and, and this game of commercial real estate. Yeah. Well, we all make that mistake. We, we fall, we mentally cash the check early and then we put our blinders on and we stop actively seeking our blind spots. And sometimes the best deals you, that you do are the ones you don't do, right? You walk from and you say, uh-uh. I just, we way too many. I've had, I've been in tenant interviews. We didn't talk about that one, but I've been in tenant interviews where the tenant just was giving me a Trevor tr treasure trove of information that was like, whoa, are you kidding me? And it's like, you know what? I know we've got some money into this deal, but I'm, I'm passing based on that information that I just heard. I'm just not comfortable with the property and where it's located and the stuff that's happened in the past. And it's just, it's going to be, it's almost stigmatized before you even get started. Right. right. You get, when you can be like a moth to a flame looking at the price per square foot. Yeah, but it's only $58 a foot. Well, there's a reason it's only $58 a foot. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, when do you when do you do the tenant interviews, Brian? And and how do you get the seller to give you agree to give you access to the tenants before your money goes hard? There's kind of that that yes, delicate right. balance. You're absolutely right. I, I put it right in. Hey, you have the right as we're negotiating the purchase and sale agreement. We have the right to interview the tenants. Sometimes it ends up being a negotiation. Well, especially if you got a savvy landlord, they'll say, nah, I don't want you to introduce uh, or interviewing them all, but uh, you can interview, you know, the top 10 or the top, depends on the size of the deal, obviously. Right. right. Or the, or 
the 60% of them or 40, you know, 70% of them, whatever it is. And to me, what I'm usually trying to interview is the major tenants or ones that are expiring in the next 12 to 18 months, right? Those type of things. That way you could ask them, hey, are you planning on staying in the property? And, you know, that type of stuff. But it, the ones that are adamant to, about it and say, no, 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 you're not interviewing any of my tenants until your money is hard. It's like, well, then we're not buying the, we're not going to, we're going to cancel escrow. Yeah. What are you hiding? Doing this? Because what have you got to hide? Well, right. I don't have anything to hide. Well, then you shouldn't have a problem with me interviewing your tenants. Right. Yeah. Then you can negotiate with them. On it. But the ones that are adamant and just dig their heels in, it's like, sorry, pal, this is not going to work. If I can't talk to your tenants, then I, I'm not interested in it because the chances are they are hiding something. Yeah. So true. So true. So um, that's a, I'll tell you what, interviewing tenants, if you learn how to do that properly, you will, that's the single greatest source of uh, um, information of a property that you're going to get. Because many times, the tenants have been there much longer than the owners have owned the building. And I've had sellers say to me, how did you know that? I didn't even, I've owned this building for 12 years and I, I didn't even know that. It's because you probably never asked your tenants the questions that I just asked them. Yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, it, it's too critical a source of information to not do. And I've just seen people get burned. You know, I, I, I I'll give you an example. This guy was buying his building and he called me up and said, Hey, I need your help. You know, I'm going hard with my money and here's some issues going on. And I go, well, didn't you interview the tenants? No. Well, why not? Because the seller refused to let me do it. And I said, well, yeah, but you have some major tenants in there. And he goes, yeah, I know. And he, he said, I'm already hard with my money. I go, well, you better hope that he wasn't hiding something from you. Well, it turned out about, you know, five or six months after they purchased the property, the major tenant in there went bankrupt. And that's ah. what he didn't want him to find out. And I've had, I flat out asked tenants, hey, you're sitting in 10,000 feet with, you know, 12 people in here. There's something wrong. Is everything okay financially? Yeah, we're, we've got some issues going on. You know, we don't know if we're going to make it there. If we, the head office said they might have to close this location. I was like, whoa. You're, that's a major one. You need to factor that into your underwriting that, that you're going to go that if that space going to go dark or, or, or vacant on you, what is it going to cost to reti it, you know, with leasing commissions and how long is it going to be uh, down for? How long yeah. is it going to take to get a lease? Right. These yeah. are big numbers because I'll tell you what, what you don't want to do is <clears throat> end up closing on the property. And then you have to go to the lender and say, we don't have enough in reserves. We need some more money. And it's like, what are you talking about? You know, and now all of a sudden they're kind of taking charge, right? We'll tell you what, you know, if we're going to do this and, you know, <laughs> and, right. and that's why you need to negotiate all that stuff up front, you know, the parameters under what leases will be approved by and all that stuff. Yep. Yeah, or you're doing a capital call and raising the really expensive money. Yeah, let, let me tell you something. <laughs> Try to have those conversations with your investors. It's yeah. Like, uh -uh. You know, yeah. we're in it as much as, as deep as we're willing to go, and you better figure out how you're going to fix this. And, you know, yeah. that's a hard conversation. Yeah. I, I I try and avoid capital calls within the first 12 months if necessary. Some Sometimes it, it makes sense to, you know, if you're going to do a rough in year two, to, to not raise it all and have it burn in the pref up front and just let them know you're going to do a capital call in the future. But that's kind of a, yeah, you're that, better off getting the, if you get, you're better off reserving for it up front, you know, and just you think so. Yeah. I, I, I'm a big believer believer in it because what happens is uh, you'll get people that'll say they're okay with putting more money in. And then when it comes time to asking for it, they've got other obligations or other things. And now you're like, trying to figure out where you're going to get your money from. Yeah. So you just have a tight operating agreement that allows you to, you know, do those things. And most people are, when you, when the, you're asked to explain, you could say, look, I just, I don't want to have to come back and ask you for it later. So let's reserve now. Right. Totally makes sense. Well, 
I got a personal question for you, Brian. Sure. If you have one day left to live, how would you spend it? Whoa, that's that's a heavy question. That's not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'd probably spend it. I mean, I I don't. I really don't. Off the top of my head, I, obviously, I'm giving you this, but I'd probably spending spend it, letting all the people that I I love and made a difference in my life, knowing how much I appreciate them and cared about them, and and let them know that they made a huge difference in my life, and and uh, that's probably what I would do. You know, if I just found out. You know, I try to do that as I'm going along, but you know how that is. It's we all get sidelined and sideswiped with stuff and busy and get crazy in our lives and put the emphasis on uh, mon more mundane things, you know. But uh, yeah. but that's a good question, though. So pivoting a little bit, um, you've written several books. I just wrote a book. It's being published in May. What advice do you have for me as I'm approaching my launch date uh, as a new author? Well, uh, I haven't gone through it uh, four times now. I can tell you that um, you really, really have to be very proactive with your marketing. Uh, don't think that your publisher... I self-published, but in fact, this last book, I was going to uh, go to a, a, some publishers and see about getting it published uh, with a major publisher. And I was told, don't, you're, you need your information out now. It's too helpful to people that need it immediately. It'll be delayed and through, don't believe they're going to market it the same way, which I've heard that all along. I've been very fortunate to uh, study uh, about book uh, marketing and what have you with Jack Canfield and some other uh, uh, people that have been in the business like Steve Harrison and what have you, who's worked with Robert Kiyosaki and, and um, some other uh, big time authors. And they all say the same thing. You need to be your own advocate with it and get it out there. If you truly believe it's a helpful thing to people, then, you know, do what I'm doing. Talk to smart people like you that have podcasts and um, get it out there and spread the word. And uh, it's, it's very rewarding. I'll tell you something interesting, Mike, that uh, if I would have known, if somebody would have told me 10 years ago, that you're going to write four books and um, you're really going to be uh, into teaching people about it. I would say, oh, that's not me. That's, that's, that's not where my interests lie, right? But what happened was after the due diligence handbook came out and I started getting the emails from people about, thank you so much for helping me with this information. It's been a huge uh, boost for me and help. I wish I would have known it earlier. And I was like, Wow, you know what? That's that's really what makes me want to do it. It's that's really the big payoff is when you hear from people how much your information has helped them. And I would say to anybody who's out there who's thinking about writing a book, which by the way, I think is a huge thing to do, but make sure you have something to say. Don't just write a book because you want to write a book. Write a book because <laughs> you believe it's you you want to tell your story or you want to uh help people if you take it from that i mean the first book i wrote was really my my own reference manual and maybe that's what made it <laughs> as uh popular as it ended up becoming is because it really was written for myself i really didn't write it for other people because it it didn't have a lot of fluff in it right yep. but um don't be here's the other thing i would tell those people don't worry about what other people think about you because the, the fact of the matter is they're not even thinking about you. They're thinking about themselves. Okay. So what do you care? I always say it doesn't matter what other people think about me. It's none of my business what they think about me. They're entitled to their own opinion. Okay. So that's really how it works. And I'll give you one more little um, saying axiom that I, that I had heard when I was in my late twenties at this old timer gave me that when I was getting into the commercial real estate business. And he said, listen, let me tell you something. 
He goes, in your 20s, you worry about what people are thinking about you. In your 30s, you don't care what people are thinking about you. In your 40s, you realize people weren't even thinking about you. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. And it's true. And at first, it kind of bugged me, but I was like, well, he's right. You know, it's that's kind of cool. (laughs) Kind of takes a lot of pressure off, right? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Brian, you've been, you've been, uh, you've been an awesome guest on the show and just a plethora of knowledge and, uh, it's great. And I highly recommend that, uh, people get out there and buy any of Brian's books. It's spelled H E N N E S S E Y. And, uh, the one that I bought was the due diligence handbook for commercial real estate, but he's got a version for residential agents and uh, a couple other things. And he's got his new book, too old to hire and too young to retire. So, Check those out. You can also Google his uh, coaching business. It's Impact Coaching Systems. If you're looking for a coach, Brian would be an awesome fit for that. Uh, he's also doing transactions as a broker. So feel free to reach out. To- and Mike, I really appreciate you having me on the show. Well, uh, hopefully uh, the show will bless you and your business as you have blessed our listeners. And uh, this is Mike Sauer signing off for this episode of the Creative Commercial Real Estate Podcast. Hey, what's up, guys? It's Mike Sowers, the host of the show. I hope you're enjoying the content and I have some awesome news for you. We're now rolling out our exclusive partnership program. And what we're doing is we're looking for investors just like you in all major metros to partner with on deals. I give you our strategy, our system, all seven steps, our funding and support network, and I'm even gonna give you our software to actually go out and implement these techniques so you can cash that first ridiculous seven-figure check. I've used this exact system to go out and create millions of dollars in net worth and tens of thousands of dollars in residual income each month. And honestly, I don't say that to impress you, but to impress upon you that the system works, you just have to follow it. But it's not for lazy people. I mean, it takes real work. You're going to need about thirty to fifty thousand dollars in working capital, and you're going to need a resilience that very few have. But if you're ready to take your investing game to the next level and scale up from flipping, wholesaling, and residential rentals into the commercial game, you can get ten times the results with literally the same amount of effort. I'm going to show you how. Why don't you check it out? Go to commercialinvestingmastery.com. You can learn more about the program. You can apply for membership, and you can even schedule a one-on-one call with me to get all your questions answered. Check it out right now. That's commercialinvestingmastery.com. I look forward to hearing from you and I wish you all the success.